Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to, I think it's our third or fourth webinar now, starting to lose count for, for MSNAP videos. And I know we've got a really large audience today, so welcome to everybody. Uh, today we have got, as I'm sure you all know, the practical guide to providing neuropsychological assessments. Um, so lots of really good speakers, really good ideas about how we can actually sort of make, make things happen better, sharing experiences, learning ideas. I'm just gonna go through some housekeeping and then I'm gonna hand over fairly quickly. I'm going to try and keep an eye on questions. If we could have the, the next slide, please. Thank you. Okay. So please do, if you see, if you hover, there's a Q&A down the bottom of your screen. If you hover over it, if it's not appearing, it should appear. Um, so type questions there. I'm going to have the formidable task of keeping an eye on all the questions. I will, I will do my best. We will answer those that come up most frequently. Um, we'll, try and answer all the questions. If we're not able to do that, then we'll ensure that we answer them afterwards. We do keep a record of all the comments and questions which come up, so that's really helpful. Um, you can raise your hand if you have something that you'd like to say. Uh, um, if we can do that, we will, but, but mainly we'll be dealing with the questions down the side. So, so thank you for that, I hope that's clear. Um, next slide, please. Yes, sorry, I'm going ahead of myself. So basically you, you can, yeah. We've done all that. So I'm going to hand over now to, to Julia, uh, who will take care of the rest of the session. I shall be, um, like I say, taking notes, taking questions, and I welcome Dr. Julia Cook to take us forward from here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Much appreciated. Um, so what I'm going to do is ask all the speakers to introduce themselves. I'll just introduce myself first. So I'm um, Julia Cook. I'm a clinical psychologist, um, neuropsychologist only in training. Um, and I work for the Early Intervention and Dementia Service and Complex Dementia Care Team in uh, Worcestershire Health and Care NHS Trust. Um, so that's me. And I'll just hand over to Rebecca, if that's okay. Yeah, hi, thanks, Julia. I'm Rebecca Poz. I'm a clinical psychologist and clinical neuropsychologist. I'm based in West Suffolk and cover an older people's uh, community mental health team and also our memory assessment service. Okay, thanks. Shall I hand the, the baton on to Renee? Hi everyone, um, I'm Rene Stolwick, I'm based here. <coughs> uh, I'm an Associate Professor and Clinical Neuropsychologist based here at uh, Monash University in Melbourne. Uh, and I guess my background, I've, I've been running a tele neuropsychology service to rural parts of Australia for about kind of three or four years now. So um, that's where my experience lies with tele neuropsychology, which I'll talk about uh, very soon. And passing over to Wendy. Hi, uh, my name is Wendy Kelso. I'm also a clinical neuropsychologist and I work at the neuropsychiatry um, service uh, at um, uh, Royal Melbourne Hospital in Melbourne, Victoria. Um, so I've been working um, providing neuropsychology assessments and feedback and some interventions via telehealth to people with young onset dementia for about two years working on a telehealth project. And I also um, run an FTD support group and we've decided to do that via Zoom as well. So I can talk a little bit about that a bit later. Thank you so much for having us today as well. Thank you both for coming. Okay, next slide please, Janine. I'll hand this one over to Renee. Oh, this is me already. Um, yeah, look, I thought what we, it would be good just to maybe acknowledge uh, that People probably will be coming into this webinar uh, from a whole range of different experiences um, with with telehealth uh, and probably lots of different attitudes towards telehealth as well. Um, and just to, I guess, set the scene about what we're trying to achieve today uh, is probably um, it's, I guess, aimed towards those people that may be in the kind of laggards or late majority people. So the people that may, may have low confidence or maybe a little bit sceptical about um, telling your psychology. The aim today is maybe just to provide you with some information and education around um, the evidence base supporting telling your psychology, both and you know the, the limitations of, of telling your psychology, as well as some of the, the practice to really build, build some confidence um, and yeah, provide important information on uh, and, and practical information. Uh, we might also be addressing maybe some of the early adopters and innovators, those people that have really jumped into telling neuropsychology that may be engaging in um, 
in practices that may be beyond the evidence base. You know, pe there are people that just jump straight in and, and may not be thinking about some of the caveats, some of the limitations that you need to be aware of. So we'll be addressing those today as well. And there will be many of you now, yeah, this COVID's been on, going on for a while now, there will be people in the middle as well, but hopefully you'll get something out of this as well. So I guess it's just good to reflect right at the start, where are, where are you on this bell curve? Are you someone that's skeptical, haven't really experienced telehealth, or are you on the other end? Um, hopefully you'll take different things out of this out of this presentation um, and this will probably just be the start uh, obviously i think we're going for about 90 minutes but as we've learned in previous webinars uh, it goes very quickly and we can never talk through everything we want so this really will be uh, i guess a, a bit of an overview of um uh, of, of tele neuropsychology with lots of signposts um throughout the webinar in terms of where to get more information next slide Okay, um, so thank you for that, Renee. Um, the learning objectives of this webinar, as Renee's already touched on there, are to understand different models of teleneuropsychology implementation, um, to understand when teleneuropsychology may or may not be appropriate to use, um, particularly within the con context of people with dementia, um, appraise the current evidence and ethical guidelines around teleneuropsychology practice um, and to consider procedures on conducting teleneuropsych assessment and intervention sessions. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we can talk through the agenda there. And um, so, so the, the schedule um, is, we're starting with um, a bit of background from me, um, just for the UK um, kind of situation where we are at the moment. Um, and then we'll move on to Renee, who will tell us a bit more about the evidence base um, and model, models of neuropsychology. Um, and then we'll move on to Wendy, who will talk about the kind of the practicalities and principles of teleneuropsych practice. Um, as well as some reflections on experience over in Australia. Um, and then we'll come to me and Rebecca and we'll just provide an overview of some experience that we've had locally um, as well, particularly around people with dementia again. Um, and Rebecca's got a, a video as well uh, later on, which will be really good to see. Um, and then we've got some time for, for a discussion um, and just closing up. So that's the plan for today. If you could go to the next slide, please. So in terms of a background, um, the UK is sort of coming out of lockdown now, um, but as we know from Leicestershire, um, there might be potential future lockdown events, um, and this way of working essentially might remain quite relevant for some time. Um, I think it's, it's a general kind of feel. Um, there's also some potentials, which I'll talk about when I think about the survey results with you. Um, at the moment, we're going through some tensions in our practice, apart from the whole COVID situation and the things that that's done to you know, the UK, to our patient population. There's some general tensions around um, what we do for neuropsych practice or clinical psychology practice in um, services in general. Um, dementia services have obviously mostly been um, put on hold for at least part of um, the, the time when COVID's been happening. Um, but as services are reopening and those of us who have been open the whole time, um, there are these tensions between um, waiting lists, referral numbers, what we do, which tests, of, what can we possibly do, which tests are valid um, to do remotely, uh, what's available, um, what's the person's clinical need, what's the question we're answering. And what are the risks associated with these new ways of working? Um, and these seem to have kind of arisen in all services, not least dementia assessment services. So as many will know, there's uh, been some helpful guidance released from NHSI and NHSE um, on remote memory clinics. And the London Clinical Networks also released some guidance. This was all around sort of April, May time. And this broadly suggests that we should assess remotely where appropriate, but we need, need to be very mindful of the caveats. Um, and it makes reference to guidance that was pulled together by the Division of Neuropsychology. Um, we also have the Inter-Organisational Practice Committee guidance, which were produced very rapidly um, in response to the COVID 
pandemic um, and the division of neuropsychology shortly followed up on this for UK specific issues. So the IOPC document provides uh, links to resources and guidelines for telepsychology more generally, but then extends those recommendations to how teleneuropsychology might be practiced. And the overall feel from the DON and the IOPC is that existing evidence does indicate that teleneuropsych might offer reliable and valid assessments, but the clinician essentially needs to, to consider many potential limitations, develop new informed consent processes, and kind of really consider it in your reporting and your conclusions, which I, I know when I first sort of started looking at this stuff, I found really kind of daunting because it just felt like this big mountain to climb. So um, I wonder if some of you might empathise with that feeling. <laughs> um, so, uh, and both papers do highlight that there might be specific issues that are pertinent to older people. Um, Pearson have also released their letter of no objection in response to COVID-19, which opens up possibilities for remote administration too. And I won't go through the evidence base because I know Renee is going to talk to you properly about that later on. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. I'm just going to share with you very briefly the results from the survey that we asked for people to complete. So there were, there were 45 respondents and there's many more people here today. I can see there's 360 at the moment. Um, so, but I think that some of the, the issues raised will be pertinent across the board. Um, so there was, uh, there was some potential strengths and opportunities, um, including re reduced waiting time, enhanced safety, convenience and service continuity to offering teleneuropsychology as well as the potential to reduce waiting lists more broadly. So accessing those people who could access this uh, technology to, to use teleneuropsych might have a broader impact on face-to-face -face waiting lists when we go back to normal. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, but many potential weaknesses, threats and challenges were also raised. Um, so mainly concerns around threats to validity, access to technology for this patient population um, and the ability of clients to engage in technology, as well as those reductions in the ability to observe behaviours um, and kind of body language really. Um, reduced environmental control and difficulties with rapport. Uh, one of the challenges was that ability to assist somebody through the process a little bit. Um, that was thought to be one of the potential weaknesses um, in offering a teleneuropsych approach. Um, the limitations in the tests available was also highlighted and client fatigue was uh, raised as a potential concern too. So if we can go to the next slide, please, I'll talk about the kind of biggest concerns that people had. Um, so really, um, it is that validity. Um, issue. So the fear around misdiagnoses, legal challenge, um, and another more pragmatic concern about whether trust would actually invest in this um, type of approach. So whether our NHS trust would support that. Um, other concerns included lack of clinical guidelines um, and consensus nationally, as well as locally around clinical governance, training, um, and clinician confidence and familiarity. Um, and there were concerns noted about who we might end up kind of inadvertently excluding from this approach. So we did this survey essentially to kind of get some ideas about what might be helpful to cover during this webinar. And although I don't think that it covers everything, um, we certainly have a bit of the start of the 10 here. So, um, so I'm going to say next slide, please. And I'll hand over to Renee. Great. Thanks so much, Julia. Okay. Um, so hopefully, that, that's a lot of concerns. Um, and that's not unusual for our discipline, I must say. I think we're our discipline of clinical psychology and neuropsychology, we're, we're a concerned bunch a lot of the time, fairly conservative at times. So, uh, and I think this is, this telling neuropsychology has been a really great example of, I guess, as a discipline, how we respond to change. And I think, as I mentioned before, we're on that, on that bell curve. Anyway. Um, before we get into um, the different models of teleneuropsychology in the evidence base, I guess it's worth just briefly talking about well, what is teleneuropsychology. Um, and I guess in a nutshell, it's providing neuropsychological services using telecommunication technologies. And I think 
everyone, not everyone, a lot of people when they think of telling your psychology go right to the, um, you know, to the interactive video conferencing type of, of, of model. Um, but in reality, I guess telling your psychology uh, actually is, is broader than that, both in terms of the services provided. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that um, we go beyond um, giving tests. So we can use telehealth to provide assessments right from clinical interviews um, of both our clients and the close others around that client, um, behavioural observations, uh, in addition to that formal psychometric assessment. And I think that's an important point around tele-neuropsychology is that it does, uh, one strategy to improve the validity and the reliability of your assessments is to you know, you do require often to go broader beyond just your tests, as, as you would normally, but I find myself relying more on, you know, the, the staff at the rural hospital or the family or whatever to inform, to inform the assessment. Um, and telehealth has also opened up lots of opportunities to provide intervention. So right from feedback from, from assessments um, and psychoeducation, right through to providing cognitive rehabilitation. And um, we've done quite a lot of work in my um, research group around providing memory rehabilitation over telehealth um, with some really great results. Um, so a whole range of services can be provided over telehealth and the evidence base is, is, is building on that. <clears throat> and it goes beyond as well the video conferencing. So a lot of you guys will be using um, telehealth already. You know, you're using phone calls, possibly, email, chat, text, um, you may be using a lot of that already. Um, and, um, and that's great. And, and an important principle is that you, you can use different telehealth technologies depending on your, on your clinical need or what's most efficient. You don't always need to set up a Zoom session. Sometimes a simple phone call is, is the simple and effective method to set up a, you know interview time or, or to get some information. Um, all depends on, on the clinical need and the person. Um, telehealth can be synchronous, so the video conferencing, um, but a lot of the work can be done asynchronously as well. You know, if, if, if you're dealing, if you're engaging with the cognitive behavioral therapy program, um, asynchronous methods such as you know, email around homework, sharing videos, uh, that's, that's all possible and really helpful. So it's, it's, it's broader than, than just the video conferencing. Um, and what I find myself, using in my practices is a combination of all of those. Um, next slide, please. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> Sorry, that was a bit of a filler slide. What I'm gonna talk about now are explaining the different models of, um, of telehealth. Um, and there's three models that I wanna talk through that serve very different functions. The first one I want to talk about is, is before COVID was the, the, the model that most people were looking at because up until COVID, um, telehealth, particularly here in Australia, was very much being used to address the needs of rural health. And this is the experience that I have most with, with tele-neuropsychology. So this is the, the model that we run here at, down, down here in Melbourne. It's the Monash Tele-neuropsychology tele service where we provide neuropsychological assessment and rehabilitation services to four rural hospitals, all around three hours from Melbourne, who traditionally wouldn't have access to neuropsychology. And we provide services to the inpatient uh, neurorehabilitation wards there. So it's from a metropolitan hub, which is where I sit here in Melbourne. I provide services to a, to a rehabilitation ward um, in these different towns. Um, and we have a, a team to do that. Um, what that requires, importantly, is a trained assistant. So we, hadn't, we have an allied health assistant that is available on that day to provide help where necessary. And we, that's um, you know, required to set up the technology, um, transfer um, the patients to that room, help out with some tests where needed, which I'll talk about soon. Um, so there is, there is a resource required. However, it's, it's a really, um, it's, in terms of restrictions, there's very few restrictions to the tests that you can provide because a lot of the stimulus is at that, uh, the stimuli are at that rural site and you can get the, the, uh, the assistant to help with the administration. Um, and obviously there's no travel requirements. Um, the negative though uh, is that it doesn't meet the social distancing 
kind of requirements. Um, so we, which will bring us to the to the next model in, in a second. Um, next slide. So this is what it looks like at Echuca, which was the first site that we um, that we went to, which is about three hours from Melbourne. And you can see it's all pretty simple. We're using uh, Zoom software. We're not using that anymore. We've moved to another program called CoView. Um, but you can see here, this is one of our patients uh, who's it's a little bit of a fake setup, really. Uh, you can see the rate complex figure there. Um, but what you can see, the setup is just using a desktop. Um, you'll see at the top there, there's two cameras, and that, those two cameras are really helpful. Um, we can switch between those two cameras. Most of the time, the camera that's facing forward is used, so during the interview and just for face-to-face -face talking. But when there's um, a motor task, we can switch the cameras so that the camera's looking down, so I can see what's going on with their hands and how they're engaging. Um, yeah, I think that's probably all I want to talk about with that. So I can ask, ask, answer specific questions later, but just to give you a bit of an idea of what that looks like. Uh, next slide. And just to give you an idea of some of the tests that we use, this is not an exhaustive test, but uh, test list, but you can see that a lot of the tests, digit span, similarities, Hopkins, verbal fluency, um, no real modifications are required. I can give those tests, um, you know, fairly easy. Um, and so there's lots of tests that, that are very straightforward to administer. There are other, other tests that what we have is some colored folders set up um, next to the client. So for example, the trial making test. Uh, we'll angle the camera down and we'll say, pull out the green folder and that folder will be trial A and we talk them through the instructions and, and um, once they finish that test, they put the folder, uh, the pieces of paper back in the green folder. Next test maybe might be the top of or whatever. Um, they pull out the red folder and, and there's the, the word list in there. So um, a lot of the tests don't require an assistant, um, you just um, need the folders there. Other tests, though, do require um, an assistant. <coughs> so, for example, block design, we need to scramble the blocks. Or visual reproduction, where um, it's really important in terms of the timing of the stimuli. And I was working in a time where uh, Pearson didn't have that um, no contest thing. So we, we weren't able to actually um, transmit any information over, over Zoom, any copyrighted information. So that's changed the landscape a lot and, and, and allowed a lot more Test to be done where now I feel quite comfortable administering matrix reasoning completely over over the internet for example but at that time uh, that wasn't happening and that's I guess a good point to to note when I started this four years ago no one was doing this and this model which is now considered quite a, a, a conservative model where you've got a clinician uh, an you know, admin person on the other end it was considered way out there and I got quite a lot of kind of harsh feedback when we started. Now it's considered a very kind of conservative model. So it just gives you an idea of how quickly tally neuropsychology is moving. Uh, and it will give you an idea of, and you know, the, the idea of what we're doing now in terms of having 300 people on a webinar was completely unheard of five years ago. So you can just think about where things are gonna be in the next five years. Um, and that might be some motivation to jump on board now um, because I think this is potentially going to um, to keep on progressing. All right, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, next slide, please. So, as I mentioned before, my experience is very much within the remote model, but when COVID started to happen and lockdown started to happen, we did need to change things up and think about, well, how can we, how can we use telehealth uh, to provide neuropsychology services? Uh, and the first model that we can talk about is this within clinic model. So the idea of a client coming to your clinic, but actually not being in the same room as you. So for example, that person can be waiting in the car park, they get a phone call, uh, directed via phone call to a room, um, and um, they could be in a, in a completely separate room or potentially in a very large room far away from you um, at, at, a, at a significant social distance. Um, good news is that you don't really need a trained assistant uh, and it does meet social distancing uh, requirements, but there are some restrictions in terms of now the tests that you can provide um, and the sensory, cognitive and motor requirements of, of the client. Because with that remote model, 
what I can do is, if there's someone with quite profound kind of cognitive issues, I can use the assistant to actually help me more and more. But you'll see very soon in this within clinic model, it does require more demands of, of the client or the patient. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this gives you an idea of what it might look like um, in terms of you will be in one room and the client could be in the, the door, the, uh, as I said, the, the room next door. A lot of the tests, again, will be very straightforward to administer. Um, digit span, similarities, Hopkins. So I'm using the same test throughout to see, to give you an idea of how things change. Um, you can now, with, with a lot of the um, publisher's permissions, you can now screen share word lists like the top of, uh, matrix reasoning, Boston naming tests, stimuli. Um, and you can, for example, um, base uh, assuming a, a certain level of cognitive competence, you can also have some tests uh, in colored folders, as I talked about before, like the trial making test. Uh, for some tests, it requires a bit of a combination of screen share and folders, yeah, or, or having materials on hand. So, for example, um, with visual reproduction, you could have the response booklet in a green folder, uh, and then you can transmit the visual reproduction stimuli, um, screen sharing on the um, uh, over Covio or Zoom or over video conference. So you can use a combination of forms next to the person in the other room, and um, and also um, yeah, using video conference. What's the advantages of that over just doing this at home, the, the, the key advantage is that you're not releasing response forms and materials out into the public space. Yeah, so nothing leaves that room. Um, that's, that's the advantage of, of this model. Uh, but it does still require the client to come in to a clinic. Um, yeah, so there's, there's, again, you need to really think about your, your site needs and what's most appropriate. Um, next slide, please. Um, if you're already using Q Interactive, um, good on you for a start. Uh, but also, you can use Q Interactive uh, in this model as well because Q Interactive relies on Bluetooth. It can go through a wall. So, if the client is in the next room uh, across from you, you can actually be using Q Interactive as, as you would in combination with using video conferencing to do the interview. So, it's quite, it works quite well. We'll be using it in our student clinic. Um, a combination of, of Q Interactive and, and Zoom works quite well. Um, it, what doesn't work, we thought would be really clever and try and screen share Q Interactive through Zoom, that, that actually doesn't work so well. Um, but actually just using Q Interactive um, to complement Zoom or, or CoView works, works quite well. Okay, next slide. And what's the advantage of Q Interactive is in terms of actually wiping test materials down, it's much easier to wipe down one iPad than lots of different stimuli. So that's, that's the advantage. <coughs> right. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm coughing. It's not COVID. I've had the test. Don't worry. It's all good. The, the last model I'll talk about is the home model. Um, and this is, you know, this is the model where you know, there might be both the clinician and the client at home or the clinician and a clinic. Um, lots, of, lots of different options there, but generally the, the idea is that the client stays within their own home. And um, obviously that meets social distancing requirements. You don't need a trained assistant, but this is, the, this is the model that has probably the most restrictions in terms of what tests you can provide. And there's most risk, um, which Wendy and the others will talk about in terms of there's issues around, you know, can you control the environment in terms of distractions? Can you make sure the tests, all the materials remain secure? All that kind of stuff. Um, yes. All right. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, next slide, please. So my poor suffering wife is always having to do these videos and photos for me. But this is a bit of an example of maybe the mocker. In terms of using the remote, um, the remote model, you can see really just the laptop on each end might be sufficient um, to to get this model working. In terms of again, no modifications are required for a lot of tests like digit span similarities, and you'll see in a second the evidence base for those tests are quite strong now, and quite a few studies are showing that those um, can be reliably and validly administered over um, over telehealth. 
Um, also, <coughs> a number of tests um, now can be screen shared. And um, as I mentioned before, everything from word lists to a whole range of different stimuli, um, which is great. I've got a few kind of question marks. So for example, one of the key limitations we'll talk about soon is, is assessment of, of speed of processing. So information processing speed. There's very few tests kind of available for that. Um, and part of a, an ongoing research project that we're looking at now is can we provide the oral version of the simple digit modalities test over telehealth? Theoretically, it could be done, but we just don't have the evidence base for it now. Uh, and I think that's important to reflect on is a lot of the tests um, are feasible to be done over telehealth, but it's important not only to look at feasibility, but also evidence for reliability and validity. And that's where the evidence base is, is emerging. There are some tests that, again, it's a controversial about whether we could be providing it. You know, for example, block design. Are we, are we comfortable with arranging stimuli to be sent out, um, opened up at the time of assessment and then sent back after the assessment? Um, for example, the blocks, trail making test forms, those types of things. Um, I think there's real risks around yeah, this, these things getting out into the public domain. Um, so that's, I guess, something that we can discuss as we go along. And it's, it's, it's a limitation at the moment. We haven't quite got that figured out. All right, uh, next slide. So in terms of the evidence base, I'm gonna whip through this pretty quickly. Am I, am I over time already, Julie and Rebecca? How, how are we going for time? How much time have I got? I think we can do another 10 minutes, Renee. Uh, okay, good. That's okay. Excellent. Okay, um, so I guess before we, before we get into the evidence base, maybe think about um, what we're looking for when we're, when we're trying to appraise the evidence for, for teleneuropsychology. Um, and to be on, to most studies to date, the, the high quality studies have, uh, in order to validate this, this um, teleneuropsychology, have really compared face-to-face -face administration with telehealth admission in a counterbalanced way. Um, in terms of what you're looking for in terms of quality, is that, is that kind of comparison between face-to-face -face and telehealth conditions? Um, and I guess what you wanna be looking at is um, thinking about the way you are going to be engaging in telehealth and the tests you're gonna be administering and the way you're administering them, are they similar uh, to the evidence base? Um, so for example, if, um, if a test has mainly been examined in, the, in the, the research in a certain way, so maybe using an assistant, and you're, you're actually using a remote model, um, the evidence base may not apply. Yeah? And you'll find that as we go through, is that there's probably less evidence for that remote model. So that's, that's important to think about when you're, doing, when you're engaging and, and thinking about your clinical formulations. The statistical tests are also really important. There's a lot of variation in the literature about what people are using. Um, some people are uh, engaging in, for example, t-tests and saying, well, there's no difference between um, telehealth and face-to-face -face on, um, on these tests, so we're going to say that they're equivalent. Um, statistically, that actually is not the same thing. Not finding a between-group difference is not the same as equivalence. Um, so there's different statistical analyses that are more appropriate in terms of demonstrating equivalence or non-inferiority. Um, Spearman and Pearson correlations are also not that, that helpful. Well, they're helpful to a degree, but if someone consistently scores 10 points below um, in a face-to-face -face as opposed to a telehealth, or, um, you'll get an almost perfect correlation because it's consistently lower or higher. Um, so those correlations can actually artificially make things look better. So in terms of statistically, what you're really looking for is intra-class correlation coefficients, which not only look at, at patterns of, of um, similarity, but also whether they're getting similar scores across conditions, using equivalence testing, uh, and also qualitative methods like Bland Altman show patterns of similarities between conditions. Um, you can get quite nerdy with all these stats. I'll probably leave it there, but I guess it's just important to think about what are the higher quality uh, statistical methods. Um, next slide, Janae, thank you. Okay. 
Um, so there are two, if you're wanting to get your head around the evidence base, there are really two studies that I'd recommend reading, and it's too much to go into today, really. But there's the Brearley um, Review, which happened in 2017. And then on the next slide, uh, it's the most recent <coughs> paper that's just come out, um, the Mara paper that's um, already just showing an additional 10 studies. We're going to see a whole huge number of studies coming out in the next few years. Everyone's now getting on board this. Um, and this. Um, so very quickly, I'll just talk, the, the great paper about Mara, it's an updated paper, um, but there's no nice, that I could find no kind of nice summary table. Um, the paper from Beerley is, is probably a, a better summary table and, and the results aren't really changing. So if we switch to the next slide, Five minutes? Five minutes, cool. Yeah, I'll, I can do this in five. Um, what we're seeing already is um, that studies are emerging uh, across a whole range of different populations, but we need to understand it's emerging, yeah? There are a number of studies with just one study looking at a certain population. So um, I think that's, that's the important thing to highlight. Um, most of the studies have been looked at in mild <coughs> cognitive impairment uh, in AD, which is great for you guys. Uh, or in healthy populations. Uh, next slide. And we're starting to see a whole, uh, I won't go through these slides, you can just flick through these slides, Sinead, but what you can see now is um, a number of tests now have been reviewed across a whole bunch of different studies. The areas in terms of psychomotor speed um, and executive functions and validity testing are probably the areas that have been looked at the least, uh, which is a bit frustrating. Um, next slide is the uh, table from Brearley, and I'll guide your attention more to the Hedges G column there. Uh, and from what from from that measure, what you can basically see is that for most studies have shown um, very little difference between telehealth and face to face face to face administration of neuropsychological tests. So this is across the tests within these studies. You can see overall um, less than kind of one-tenth of a standard deviation between um, uh, between conditions. And what you'll notice, the ones like the Grosch study, 2015, Low, Montani, uh, and Vestal, they are the studies with very small sample sizes. So Grosch, 2015, for example, I think had a sample size of eight. So the studies, the high quality studies, like Callum, 2014, is the highest quality study that I could find. Sample size of 200, you can see the difference is almost at zero for those studies. So the higher quality studies are showing less difference in terms of telehealth, which is the right way to be, is the right trend that we're looking for. Next study, oh, sorry, next slide, uh, is looking at the different tests. And again, what you're seeing is around about um, within one-tenth of a standard deviation, which is it's fairly minor if we're thinking about um, uh, our tests. Um, what showed up in these tests, uh, a, slight, a slight trend for um, timed tests um, or tests where repetition's an issue, for example, like digit span or list learning, that's where you're getting a, a difference of around one-tenth of standard deviation. And the Boston naming test, for example, as well, for some reason, um, whether that holds over time, who knows. Okay, next slide. And this is just results from our study that's coming out. Uh, very soon, uh, we looked at uh, neuropsych assessment in stroke, and you can see most tests are coming out in the excellent to good range. Uh, with very, when you're looking at uh, equivalence testing, which is not here, it's also looking pretty good as well. Um, being a perfectionist, I always am drawn to the fair, the yellow column, going, oh God, what are the problems? Um, the stroop uh, is actually not too much of a problem. It's the, I think the ICCs they can be compromised when you have a ceiling or a floor effect and there was a bit of a, a lack of range for the stroop. The Hopkins, um, yes, was, was low as well. And we're still trying to figure that out. Um, what's interesting, uh, when you do these types of studies, it's interesting to look at what is the retest reliability of the Hopkins in clinical populations. And I was quite shocked to see that it's quite lower than what's published in the manuals, which generally looks at healthy populations. So when Jody Chapman, who was trying to understand why we got quite a low 
uh, result um, when she started looking at the Hopkins more generally there were some issues there so uh, that's important to uh, to understand that actually this might just be about variability in a stroke population um, okay I think I'm on to my last slide uh, so a bit of a summary so overall I guess the emerging evidence and it's emerging so that's that's important this is a limited evidence base but the results so far are going in the right direction and um, I guess where you're thinking about where the strengths are and the weaknesses are, well, let's let's be a bit negative and think about well, where is the evidence least. Well, the evidence is 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 re, is the least for the home assessment model. Most studies have used a remote or within clinic model, so that's important to to rationalise. There's relatively less evidence for executive functions and psychomotor speed. There's also, and I think there are a lot of assumptions that um, telling neuropsychology is not really that appropriate for older people. I would actually argue that the evidence base is the strongest for older people. Most of these studies have been done in healthy older uh, populations. Where the evidence base is less is for people with moderate to severe cognitive and communication issues. That's where I feel the least kind of um, comfortable um, with, with the evidence base. So we need to work on that. Uh, and there's cross-cultural biases as well, which is a common theme and a very disappointing thing. Um, I'm going to leave it there, I think. I guess my, my final point, though, is that even though there is a limited evidence base, the, the, the data is pointing in the right direction. And the way I tend to think about telling neuropsychology, and we'll talk about this later when we talk about report writing and how we disseminate results, is this is just another example of telling in neuropsychology where evidence base is limited. You know, so for example, we all do assessments with people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. It's another example of where our evidence base is quite limited. Our tests aren't particularly well validated. And what we do is we integrate that into our clinical reasoning and we put caveats in place you know, and, we and we adjust for that in our interpretations. This is just another example of an area of, telling neuropsych of, an area of neuropsychology where we need to be doing that. It doesn't mean that we don't do it. Um, it means that you just got, you've got to be careful and sensible when you're engaging in this uh, and, and adjusting your interpretations and, and your formulations appropriately. Right. Okay. I think that's it from me. I might pass over to I think Wendy. We're heading heading your way. Yeah, that's right. Uh, thanks, Renee. Um, thanks everyone for having us. So I'm going to talk through um, what you need to do when you're setting up Kelly Neuropsychology practice. And I'll go to the next slide, please. So I'm just going to go through about um, a couple of steps that you need to think about before you decide to use teleneuropsychology. But I also want to just mention briefly, um, as Renee mentioned before, this is like learning a new language for many people. So no one has um, had training in teleneuropsychology um, in the university programs. And it is quite a different skill and it will take quite a long time to learn just to get comfortable with the medium. And so I do think um, it's quite hard adopting a completely new way of practice in an extremely anxiety provoking time in general. So it's hard learning something like neuropsychology and teleneuropsychology, even if it wasn't in the COVID-19 pandemic, but it's particularly hard when there's so much change in every other area of your workplace. So I think everyone needs to give themselves a little bit of slack and also a little bit more time to practice and get used to it before they feel comfortable. The first thing we really need to go through is, um, these are the steps I'll be talking about today. Um, first is identifying the reason um, for doing teleneuropsychology. Um, and then I'm gonna go through, is it appropriate? Which model that um, you're adopting? And obviously for most of you at the moment, it would be an in-home model considering the situation with COVID. And then I'm going to go through technology. Uh, and I'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, looking at the environmental setup, thinking about special considerations that you need to think about. Is the client suitable to have a teleneuropsychology assessment? Um, and also, is the clinician suitable to provide that assessment? Then we'll talk a tiny bit about informed consent, um, how to set up the appointment. Next slide, please. Um, how to conduct the appointment, a few tips on telehealth etiquette, because it is a different way of seeing people and you do need a few different tips and tricks to make it the most effective and the most seamless for yourself um, and for the client. We'll talk about reporting and some special considerations as well. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the first thing I wanted to talk about was um, just thinking about the clinical priorities during the COVID-19 pandemic. So there's what's best practice, um, gold standard practice for neuropsychology, and then there's what's acceptable during COVID. And I think they may be quite different. And really our ultimate goal is keeping people safe and well. And that's talking about both their physical health, their mental health, their cognitive health, and also their spiritual health. And, uh, and obviously teleneuropsychology is one way to um, help people in terms of the assessment side of it, but there's other tasks as well. Um, that we can do as well that are not just related to assessment, which may be more useful for your clients than assessment alone. Uh, so obviously we wanted to try and prevent um, uh, older people being admitted to hospital because that's an unsafe place for them to be at the moment and also to try and prevent them to be um, placed in um, aged care facilities or residential care facilities because that's risky for them as well. And I don't know what it's like um, in Britain, but certainly here in Australia, uh, um, family members and carers are not allowed to visit um, people in residential care at the moment because of the risk, which causes great isolation difficulties for the family unit. We also want to try and prevent delirium by making sure that they keep um, as medically well as they can, and that's another way that telehealth can be useful, not teleneuropsychology, but telehealth in general, keeping older people well enough that they can continue to have their medications monitored and their other chronic um, health conditions monitored as well. We can try and assist people, um, whether it's phone or by telehealth, um, with behavioural and psychological symptoms of dementia. And also try and, um, as a clinical priority, um, look at our most at-risk families, I suppose. So clients where there may be um, potential abuse or there's neglect, that they're neglecting their physical health or their mental health, um, or that they're at risk of losing their accommodation or that they're at risk of um, becoming unemployed, particularly if you're seeing someone with young onset dementia. Those people are probably higher clinical priorities and you should prioritise them when you're triaging on your list. Uh, I think it's what we've been doing here is for people that we can't actually use a telehealth platform, we've even just been calling the clients and their families to check in how they are and to try and um, problem solve uh, and try and um, support them and also um, can provide some containment and some counselling in this very difficult time for people living in the community. Go to the next slide, please. Just thought I'd quickly talk about um, when telehealth's not an option. Uh, so there'll be some people where um, that it's just not possible, that they either do not have access to the technology um, uh, or they're too scared to use it uh, or they've got um, visual impairment or other cybersensory impairments, which makes it very difficult. Um, or that they just preferred not to try telehealth and they're very worried already about um, getting COVID and they really don't want to have to the stress of trying a new method of seeing someone. So if phone's your only option, what can you do? And you can actually do still quite a lot. Um, and as I was talking about before, phone's great for triaging urgent issues, you can manage crises and you can, you know, um, phone families and talk about uh, the ways that you can go forward, how long that they potentially may have to wait, to give them some containment and some guidance um, about what's going to happen in terms of the future, and also try and provide some cognitive screening if you're very worried about their cognition, um, liaise with their GP and other people in their team. We've also been providing, um, we've been providing Zoom telehealth support groups, but I know that there's a lot of other colleagues in Australia that have been providing um, telephone support groups to people with dementia and mild cognitive impairment as well which is really important. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I'll just talk now about getting ready for the assessment. Uh, next slide. So the first thing is technology, and I'll only talk about this really briefly. Um, look, the evidence base obviously has been with a hub and spoke model or a satellite model, where virtually always the client has been um, viewing a desktop computer at the other end. And now that we're usually seeing people um, at home, uh, it's quite different. So you might be seeing people where they're um, viewing you via an iPad or by a laptop. And uh, look, we have seen people for some things via a phone, but it's absolutely, I would not recommend it um, as a first choice. If you're doing any type of formal assessment, I think that an iPad is the smallest screen size that um, you could use and really 13 inch is best. We have dual screens ideally um, at the clinician end, which makes it much easier in terms of the screen sharing function. Uh, in terms of speed, if you can have broadband connection um, or cabled internet, that's ideal because it's less likely to break down. 
um, but try and make sure that the, um, the client has stable Wi-Fi um, and that you have stable Wi-Fi at home as well by minimising everyone else using the Wi-Fi at your house just to make sure that your Wi-Fi is the most stable it can be. And in an emergency, you can use in Australia anyway, like a 4G or 5G backup. In terms of the platform, I think the platform's probably already decided for you in terms of, I know that Julia said um, that WebEx has been the preferred choice for some of the NHS. We use something called Health Direct, which is backed by CoView here, um, but many of them have similar functions. But you need to make sure that, um, that you're able to screen share well, that it's got a chat function, a PDF sharing function, a camera, um, obviously you need a camera to do the setup and also got a whiteboard. We generally don't see people wearing um, headphones, but you absolutely can. And that's particularly useful if you've got a number of clinicians um, doing telehealth appointments in the same area, you can get some feedback. So sometimes um, lapel microphones um, with headphones can be really useful. Next slide, please. So the first thing that you need to think about in terms of Telehealth 101 um, is thinking about uh, prior to the appointment, uh, where will the person be seen? Um, so if they're going to be seen at their home, um, have they got a suitable room where they'll have a desk and a chair and a setup that's going to work? Um, it's really important to call the client prior to obtain written and verbal consent to proceed and explain what's going to happen and check access to technology and support. Um, so it's important to do a test call prior to iron out any tech issues and to reassure that the client that you'll be on their side trying to support them and um, uh, work through issues together. If you're going to use a support person at the other end in terms of a family member just to help with setup, you need to advise them about what they are able to do and what they're not able to do in terms of um, not answer the questions for the client and also that they may have to leave the room when you're doing the formal testing and may only be present for the interview. Next slide, please. In terms of consent, um, you would have seen the British Psychological Society, um, the DON guidelines for the sample consent form, and that's looking at written consent and outlining that obviously a teleneuropsychology approach is different from seeing face, someone face to face, that there's not enough, um, there's less evidence, I suppose, um, that there is when you're seeing someone face to face. And because of that, that um, the potential conclusions that you're draw, drawing in terms of diagnostic certainty are somewhat less than they would be if you saw them face to face. So we go through that um, all uh, on the phone before we see the client and get verbal consent. And then we also get written consent before we see the person. Next slide, please. When you're setting up your workspace, um, if you're seeing someone uh, and you're at home and they're at home, it's really important that for the clinician that their environment is quiet and free of distractions. So whether that's you're telling your children or your other family members that you're on a video call by putting a sign on the door or ensuring that you've got a quiet and um, confidential space, that's very important. Um, and make sure that you minimise all the external distractions in the environment as you can. That's also extremely important for your client that you have to advise them that they need the quietest area possible and they can't have their children coming in, they can't have their pets coming in through the assessment. That's the same quality and you expect the same privacy laws if you're seeing someone face to face. We always make sure that we open applications such as if you're using Q Global that you open, for example, the Waste Stimulus books before you see the client so you've got it set up already but you make sure that you close down your email so you're not getting alerts as you go through. Um, we always have a contact number beside us um, of the client and also make sure that we also have their email address, um, a mobile phone and a landline if we can, and also very importantly, um, a contact for their next of kin if that's possible. Um, and once you've got all that sorted out, um, obviously put your phone on silent um, just so it doesn't interrupt the call. Make sure the lighting and sound's appropriate. So obviously um, you might need to uh, help your client adjust their windows or blinds to make sure that they've got optimal lighting. And that for you, that confidential information is out of view in your setting as well. Next slide, please. So in terms of the appointment, as I was saying before, you reassure the client that there's a backup plan if technology breaks down. Um, and you've got all of the details of the client of the next in kin before you start the appointment, that you are absolutely sure that you know where the client's being seen. So even if you have their home address, they may have gone, for example, to their daughter's or son's house, 
So you need to know where the client is in case there's an adverse event and you need to contact the, um, the appropriate medical treatment people. Um, once you've checked sound and vision, if you've got some difficulties, uh, you can actually adjust the bandwidth on some of the platforms, which means that the image is a little bit grainier, but the connection is much more stable, which can be quite useful. Um, position the camera, camera so that you're looking at it. Sometimes I get, um, particularly if we're training students, we get uh, put little um, sticker of eyes actually on the camera because it's very easy, for example, to look down, but really you need to be looking at the camera so the client sees your eyes um, rather than them. If you look at the screen, then it looks like you're looking down. And then you just continue the appointment like you would with any other. Next slide, please. So I think if you try and normalise it as much as possible, then that makes um, the client feel that it's the same as face to face. So if you're not anxious, um, then they'll be much less anxious because they feel that, um, that the person seeing them is confident with this type of technology, they know what's going to go on, they can problem solve and it's going to be okay. So look, obviously you just do your normal introductions in terms of your name and position. I always say who's in the room with the client because you may be able to hear that they've got family in the background but you can't see them in the line of view. So I always introduce who's with me. I usually maybe show the camera around um, my room to show that it's private and it's only me in the room or I introduce a student if I've got one with me. And then I make sure that they introduce everyone that's with them and then I ask the people obviously to leave if they're not meant to be there or I get them all involved in the family interview. Reassure them that the confidentiality is the same if I saw them face to face and privacy laws still apply. And I usually have um, my ID badge visible um, from the hospital just so they know that it's an appropriate person seeing them. Um, explaining the structure and content can really calm people down so they know what to know what's going to happen next. And also set expectations. So how long the assessment's going to be for, that it's going to be by telehealth, that you might have a virtual break halfway through and that um, there's assistance available if you need. I always check what the client's understanding is of um, the session and also try and work with the client to make it um, most useful to them. And because it's new technology and they may be nervous, if you try and get the person on board with you that make it a joint session where you're really thinking about what might be the, the problems that the client's experiencing and how you can help them the best, they're more likely to engage and the rapport's more likely to be stronger. Next slide, please. So as an example, I might say, um, thank you very much for coming in to see me today. My name is Julia and I'm a clinical psychologist based in Kidderminster's Dementia Assessment Service. And while I normally see you face to face, today we'll be conducting an appointment via video call. So this is new technology. It will require some changes to the way we work together. Please be patient while we adjust to a different way of working and we'll do our best to ensure that this is a useful service for you. And if you have any questions or concerns, please let me know. Next slide. I'm going to quickly talk about um, telehealth etiquette now. So in terms of adapting your therapeutic skills, as I was saying before, um, it definitely is different seeing someone via telehealth and seeing them face to face. Often you're only seeing this much of them, but that doesn't mean that you can only see that much of them. And it's really important to feel once you get confident with the technology, that if you need to do some assessment of the, um, the client's walking, for example, or even getting them to put their hands up so you can see um, if they've got tremor in their hands, um, just getting them to stand up so you can get a visual of their body or walking across the room, that can be extremely useful um, in terms of getting a good idea of, um, uh, for the mental state examination as well of what's going on. Uh, you need to be quite animated when you're um, on a telehealth call because it is a little bit harder to read facial expression and to read some of the non-verbal cues. So if you make them more exaggerated, that can be really useful. So big smiles and frowns um, and the voice should be clear and animated and not monotone. And make sure that your body language um, mirrors what you're trying to express. Um, in terms of empathy, if you want to be seen as more um, empathic, obviously you can kind of lean into the camera or if you want to be more distant, you can um, sit back a little bit. Um, it does require a high level of attention. And some of you that have been doing neuropsychology assessments via telehealth, often we're so exhausted um, by the end because I think it is also more exhausting for your client, but it's probably most exhausting for the clinician because you're trying to manage new technology as well as engage the client, develop rapport, which can take more effort. 
and so the whole thing is a little bit more tiring. And you may need to take a couple of breaks um, or see someone over a couple of sessions. Um, once you've started, I would minimise, you can usually see, um, certainly with CoView anyway, yourself and the client. Once you use the technology, I'd minimise yourself, so you're just seeing the client, so it seems a bit more natural, and therefore you as a clinician is not distracted looking at two different images. Next slide, please. In terms of building rapport, um, I always um, ensure that there's physical privacy. Um, and I think a lot of people that are nervous about using telehealth to begin with, a lot of neuropsychologists and other um, health professionals rush into the assessment. They're so worried about the technology not working that they just try and get to the nuts and bolts without spending enough time on the basics of introduction and the small talk and getting to know the client to begin with, which can put the client at ease, which means you're much more likely to get a valid assessment of how they're truly going because they're not anxious or fearful. So I think it's really important to put in that time. And be explicit that if you're not sure, um, if you're thinking that they might be sad or that they seem to be um, <clears throat> uh, frustrated or having difficulty concentrating, um, ask them and um, be explicit about the questions that you're asking, just so you know what's going on. Um, clients do tend to reveal more than they do in session. There's something about the telehealth medium, which means that it's slightly um, less formal than seeing someone face to face. And you do need to be mindful of boundaries uh, because of that. Um, and as we go along, we always summarise. So after the history, for example, I would um, do a brief summary of what they've told me, repeat it back to them just to make sure um, that I've comprehended what they've said accurately and they also understand that I've understood what they're saying. Next slide, please. It's important to check in with the client, as I was saying before, because it's new for them and they may be very anxious. And look, they may be too nervous to say, look, I can't actually hear you well, or I can't see you well, or I didn't understand what you said, or that you've got a stain, for example, on your shirt that's very distracting. The client may feel nervous saying that. So it's always good to check in and ask how they're going. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna briefly talk about special considerations. I know it's seven o'clock, so, um, I'll talk really briefly. Now, I know that I think Julia um, and Rebecca are going to go through some tests, so I might skip this slide and go on to the next test. Next slide. So in terms of clients with hearing impairment, so we have seen a lot of people um, with dementia, uh, both at home and also um, using a hub and spoke site where they may be at a GP surgery or at another rural service. It's important when you're doing the, um, the test call that you work out if they have any hearing difficulties and then you make sure that they have their hearing aids on the day of the assessment. Um, sometimes it may be even more effective for them to take their hearing aids out and you just turn up the speaker volume depending on if they get any feedback. Um, and you can consider using a headset to minimise feedback um, both on their end and at your end. It's really important to speak loudly and clearly and enunciate and also look at the camera when you're talking because a number of people may be lip reading and ask the person to repeat back what they've heard. Next slide. Uh, for clients with low vision, um, we often would use an assistant. Um, usually it would have been a clinician, for example, like an OT or an allied health assistant, but at home it usually would be a family member to facilitate the assessment. And that doesn't mean that they'd be there necessarily for the whole assessment, but it would be there um, to set them up for the technology to begin with. If the person's completely blind, it's still worth, if you can, doing a telehealth assessment so you can see the client and do mainly verbal assessment, but some visual assessment, get them to do some drawing and other things. And often in that situation, an OT assessment and a good informant history is actually um, extremely useful. And just think about, um, as with all of these type of things, think about what you would do if you saw the person um, in person. It's actually not that different via a screen. Next slide. For people with communication difficulties, particularly if you're seeing people with language variant dementias um, or aphasia, it will take extra time and you may need to see them over a couple of sessions. And it's a good idea to work out what time that they work out um, they're the best in terms of their speech and cognition where they're the least fatigued and try and set up the appointment for them. Make sure obviously you reduce um, all the distractions and that you pause before and after important information. And I always check in with the client um, when I'm doing a test call prior or with the family about what's the easiest way to communicate with the client and what's the most effective for them. 
We often find that um, asking yes no questions is good. And for clients with communication difficulties, we use the chat function and the whiteboard and screen share tools um, quite a lot. And always just use a lot more gestures and um, keywords and draw pictures if we need to communicate more effectively. Next slide. Uh, interpreters, look, this is quite tricky. Um, it's an area that um, we've had some experience with, uh, but it is more difficult, obviously, doing an assessment with an interpreter, um, even if you're seeing them face to face. And then it's an extra layer if you're using telehealth. Obviously, if you can employ a psychologist that speaks the, uh, the dialect of the client, that's ideal. Otherwise, the options we have in Australia are phone interpreting, teleinterpreting, where you have three people on the call, or the interpreter on site. And look, if it's at all possible, um, uh, and I know that's quite hard with physical distancing, but it is easiest if you're able to have the interpreter either with the client or ideally with the clinician, socially distanced, and then you're just seeing the client via telehealth. But it may be that you need to use phone interpreting or teleinterpreting in terms of people being seen at home and if you're seeing the client from your own home as well. We always get the... Um, pre-brief the interpreter in terms of that it's different obviously via telehealth and give them enough time before you see the client to translate any tasks that you may need and get them to give you an impression of their expressive and receptive language in their native tongue such as speech intelligibility and um, word finding and their thought form. And we also find that if you're working with interpreters via telehealth and it's the um, interpreter is the first person to give the um, client the diagnosis, that can be really tricky. So you need to give them a lot of support and um, education beforehand if that's going to be the case. Next slide. Look, most people obviously you see will have some level of cognitive impairment. I think one of the questions that we've got um, often asked is how much is too much cognitive impairment to be seen by a telehealth? Now, for some people, for example, if they're getting below about 40 on the ACER, for example, or on one of the screening tools out of 100, um, they're probably going to need an assistant with them, a family member to be able to make that um, worthwhile and to support them throughout the assessment. And that may be actually quite similar if you saw them face to face as well. Um, and those people, you need more time and more virtual breaks to keep them engaged and keep them supported and keep rapport up. Because the clients may be very, very anxious, particularly if they're very cognitively impaired. It does take longer to develop rapport and it does take longer to reduce their anxiety levels. And you'll need to factor that in in terms of your clinic scheduling. And if you can, normalise the assessment for people. Explain what's going to happen as clearly as you can to give them a feeling of more control over what's going to happen. Next slide. Mm. Look, for clients with behavioural change, I'm not sure how much behaviour management you're doing in terms of the memory clinics. We certainly have to do some over here. And we find that it can be really useful, a telehealth medium, but ideally, um, in terms of setting up a behavioural plan, if you can see the client in person to begin with, that's wonderful, and then you can do a lot of the follow-up appointments by telehealth. Um, but sometimes that's not possible. So the work then is really with the family member or the residential care facility. Um, rather than necessarily with the client themselves. So it's really a whole team approach that you need. Mm. Next slide, please. Look, I'll talk about the pros and cons really briefly, but I think Julia and um, Rebecca are going to talk about that a little bit more. So I might just um, go on to the next slide. This is an example of reporting. Um, so in the reports, and certainly in the IOPC guidelines um, and some of the other guidelines, it's examples about what you should say in a neuropsychology report, I think. Um, and so we always say, look, um, the type of platform that we use to see the client on, um, the size of the screen that we saw the client on, um, who was present for the interview and who was present for the testing, and what modifications were needed um, in terms of the tests, which um, varied from standardised administration. Uh, we'd comment on the sound and visual quality, if there was any breaks in the technology and how and why they occurred, and if they were resolved and anything else that was useful. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, I'll skip over this in the essence of time. I don't think I'll talk about Medicare legal assessment because I think Rebecca's going to mention it really briefly, but obviously there's been vigorous debate on all um, forums and chats uh, about whether um, telehealth should be considered 
uh, whether teleneuropsychology should be considered um, for medical legal assessments. And um, the biggest thing, obviously, is um, test integrity and copyright, and um, if people can cheat, effort testing, a whole range of other things that people are quite worried about, as well as being scrutinised in court. And we'll probably talk about a little bit about that in the discussion if it's relevant for people. Next slide, please. So in terms of risk management, um, the, probably the most important thing you need to know if you're worried about if a client may be at risk, um, also obviously screen them before you see them. Uh, but you need to make sure obviously that you know that the area that they're being seen in quite well. So if you need to call the mental health team or you need to call the aged care assessment team or their GP or their hospital, you know where they're living close enough and you know the supports so that you can get those people to help out if you need it. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of being good at telehealth, what do you need to do? Um, I think you need a patient and calm demeanour and you need to practice. That's probably the most important thing to do before seeing clients so you feel comfortable. But certainly if you're unflappable, that's great because technology will break down and sometimes people tend to panic um, and the client's relying on you to be the one that's calm and sensible with a good strategy forward. So you need to have um, the tips and tricks to be able to solve the problem if you need to. Being able to refresh the screen, fix the technology, do a backup call if you need to can be really useful. I think you need to be able to develop rapport quickly um, and get the trust and respect of your client and family very quickly as well. And be quite flexible and open-minded. And it's important to be aware of cultural and social issues in the communities where you're seeing your clients if it's a different location to where you are. Next slide, please. All right, so in terms of the take home messages, um, we might talk a bit about them at the end, but basically Renee was talking before about, there's a lot of emerging evidence to suggest that teleneuropsychology um, is generally equivalent to face-to-face -face assessments, but the evidence certainly isn't there yet. There's only be certain tests that have been studied in certain populations and using a hub and spoke model, not in home assessment. And there is obviously concerns within home assessment that you cannot control the environment as you would um, if you were seeing someone at a different site. <clears throat> it's certainly not appropriate for every situation. And um, obviously for some people, if they don't have technology, we're worried that they cannot access a service um, and the inequity of that. And trying to provide equal service to everyone is obviously very important. And you need to get appropriate training and be flexible and creative um, when you're trying to do this type of work. Next slide, please. <clears throat> There's some resources that we'll put out as well. And I think now we're handing over to Julie and Rebecca and then we'll take questions after that. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, that was really helpful to get a sense of the practicalities involved. Um, really appreciate that. And it's, it's much needed because it definitely feels like a bit of a mountain to climb at the beginning when first starting to use this approach, I think. Um, and thank you to Renee as well for the discussion of models and the evidence base. That's really, really helpful. Um, I can definitely relate to the exhaustion that you mentioned as well, Wendy, having done a couple of these. I felt more exhausted than the patients. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, OK, um, so just briefly thinking about local experiences in Worcestershire, um, I think most services will have developed their own ways of working while COVID-19 is ongoing. And in the chat function, the Q&A, there's been some discussion about ACE, uh, remote ACEs and things like that. I'm just going to very briefly share with you some of what we've been doing in Worcestershire. Um, so the model and process of deciding the assessment approach is shown on the screen. Um, and most often the person is contacted from the waiting list having been rag rated throughout and a discussion is held about their current presentation to inform how to proceed um, if it seems they might be appropriate for a video call um, after a brief clinical interview and assessment the remote approach is the new normal um, and it's first line for our team assessments and for neuropsychological assessments as well we've got a project ongoing um, which aims to loan tablets out to patients to enable them to attend WebEx appointments, which is being supported by our trust and we're hoping to get enough tablets to make that a success. Um, so they can just press a button and then get on to WebEx to see us. 
Um, so the process risks and benefits are discussed in full with the person and their relative using a bit of a crib sheet to prompt us um, and to decide how to proceed um, collectively and gain consent to the process. Um, and we're developing a hybrid model which can be used where appropriate. So face to face for some aspects and remote for others um, and face to face only where necessary. So, for instance, if you're assessing somebody with young onset dementia or with neurological problems, um, then you might need a full visual of the patient and that might be a bit more challenging to do remotely um, or if there are parts that are not possible to do remotely at all. So OT assessments are a bit of a challenge at the moment, for instance, because often there's risks associated with the people who, who warrant a, an OT assessment. Um, so we're, we're in uh, the development of the formal kind of remote and hybrid pathways. Um, this bit has been supported by a shift in um, the processes in the team. So there's been a shift in pre-assessment counselling, which is now done by phone or by WebEx, um, and specifically the assessment process, which is led by more by nurses and other staff, um, as well as doctors, um, and is offered remotely. So experienced staff are doing those clinical interviews and assessments by phone or WebEx and using the remote ACE by WebEx where appropriate. Staff are also running therapeutic groups remotely where possible and psychiatrists where it's ethical, um, safe and helpful to do so and where all the necessary information has been gathered will divulge working diagnoses remotely where appropriate. Um, we can offer working diagnoses uh, without the scan if it's based on the patient or public interest. And imaging is still a barrier. I think that services in the UK are starting to gear up to offering imaging, but I know that um, there, are, there are competing priorities around that. And so it's tricky to access at the moment. Um, okay, next slide, please. I thought I'd just go through a very brief case example um, of somebody I assessed on uh, our inpatient ward, and he's given consent um, for me to talk through this today. Um, so the reason for referral of this person was he was presenting with possible DLB, um, possible vascular change, a psychological cause or another known neurological cause. And he had a presentation of progressive cognitive change and extensive hallucinations. He had absolutely no familiarity whatsoever with video tech. Um, and he also had reduced educational and occupational attainment through morbidly. Um, so I did the clinical interview separately with the patient and his wife uh, with informed consent from him. And we went through some questionnaire measures to support the assessment because it is a bit more tricky to assess remotely. Um, so I thought that would back it up a little bit. Um, the assessment was supported by the ward OT, who was really instrumental in this process um, and maintained a social distance. So we chose tests that would work for remote administration with a bit of assistance. Um, and he'd been through neuropsych a couple of years earlier. So to do this, I used WebEx, Q Global, and a document camera, which was really pivotal because a document camera, you can show the, the stimuli um, in a kind of legal allowed way. Um, <laughs> so you can project the stimuli onto the screen for the patient to see. Um, so we did a partial repeat of his previous assessment and we added new tests in to examine for other factors too. And you can see the tests that I did on the slide. And when I was planning this assessment, I thought, no way, this isn't going to be OK. <laughs> um, but actually, he engaged in the assessment really, really well. Um, and I guess it's important to note that some of the tests were only possible because the OT was on site. So I used a couple of information processing tasks, which obviously if I had to, I wouldn't be able to send them out to somebody's home. Um, but because it was on a ward environment, we could use those tasks. Um, so so that, that really helped. Um, and the feedback from the patient was, I was nervous about using the new devices, but I enjoyed it and it gave me something to do. Um, and if you can help uh, to find out what's causing this problem in my head, it will be very helpful. Um, I found it absolutely exhausting. We did it over about four sessions, one of which was quite a long session. Um, the patient found it less exhausting, but did get a bit frustrated with himself at times. Um, and the OT reported much of the behavioural observations that I couldn't see. So we did a bit of a debrief afterwards. Um, and it was really useful to get his, her qualitative feedback. Um, 
I think the validity was enhanced by having the OT there and this sort of debrief after each session. My sense about the validity is that it appears to be quite a valid reflection of his ability and it certainly fits when triangulating with the clinical history and the scans we have available. But when I'm writing it up, I will of course put clauses in the report as Wendy suggests and the IOPC guidance indicates because I don't know for definite. So um, it's better to err on the side of caution. Um, so I'm going to just hand over to Rebecca to talk about local experiences in Norfolk and Suffolk. So next slide, please. Hi, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I didn't want to be outmapped by all of the other speakers. So I've put a, this is us in Suffolk at the top and also the one at the bottom. because it's probably one of the only maps where Barry St Edmunds is given equal weighting to London and Paris. So, so that's us. Um, but actually that yellow uh, Suffolk map, we're divided into two different memory clinics. So we've got the East and the West and we function slightly differently. Um, we're, we're commissioned in slightly different ways and we sit, one, one side sits more in primary care and one side sits more in secondary care. And so the relevance of that has also been about the access that we've got to estates and to spaces. Um, so we did at one point have, I think 300 people on our waiting list just for West Suffolk. Um, which is quite a task to then think about how to start processing that, how to make sure that everybody gets access to the clinical work that they need. Um, so I've been able to continue with a, a, a slightly less frequent but um, an offer of neuropsychology throughout the COVID lockdown by virtue of having access to remote. Um, the clinic spaces have started up more recently, but what we've now got is a kind of a menu of offers I think is the jargon that they like to use. So we have now the option of offering people a remote assessment over the uh, tele-neuropsychology. We can offer face-to-face -face as a home visit or dressed up in PPE. In the West we have access, uh, the team have worked really hard on accessing a clinical space that is deep cleaned and all the clinicians um, are in PPE very carefully timetabled about when people can come in and when they can't. We have tables with perspex screens. Um, so a lot of effort has gone into that. Um, and also, as uh, Wendy was saying, for, for some people, the telephone is the option that's used. Um, so as we know, every clinical contact starts with consent. Um, and so with consent, we have to make sure that the person has the capacity to consent to that. Um, and uh, so, sorry, I'm getting a phone call in the middle of this from the manager of the memory service. Um, so, you know, the, the, the extent to which we're assessing somebody's capacity is more or less in depth, depending on the setting that we're working in. Um, but obviously the burden on us as the member of staff is to provide sufficient information that the person can make that decision. So if we can go on to the next slide. So what I drew up, um, and this may or may not be useful, it may or may not be quite accurate. And I know within um, NSFT, we've been having conversations about, is it, is it okay to say it's you know, a less accurate way of, of obtaining a diagnosis? Or if somebody's very, very obviously impaired, is it just as accurate? But um, what I've tried to do here, so there's a second slide in a minute that you can, we can go to is to, to sort of look at the risks and the benefits of every option and looking at it from the risks and the benefits to the diagnostic process and also the risks and the benefits to um, the person or to us in terms of the COVID risk as well. So we're kind of weighing up all of the different things that somebody might need to take into account. Um, so if you want to have a look at the next slide as well. So, um, so again, going through sort of what it's like. Obviously, if somebody has a computer-based assessment, it enables us to be seen without having to wear a face mask. So certainly for a few of the people that I've seen in clinic um, or at home wearing a mask, that's caused a lot more difficulty um, with hearing and or lip reading. So then we're obviously having to ask ourselves when we write up that report, what actually am I assessing here? Am I just assessing a hearing impairment or am I actually enabling this person to process this auditory information and I am actually assessing a memory problem? Um, so the video-based assessment removes that problem. 
Um, and but you know, we, we're saying realistically, there is slightly less uh, research evidence out there. So it's going to be a little bit more difficult. And, you know, certainly things like, um, say, the CAM prompts and assessments, complicated assessments of uh, prospective memory or of executive functioning, they're very tricky to administer. Um, there could be some tests out there already. So there's things like the Jansari executive function test, the GEF, which in the way it's been designed is already held on a computer platform. So I'm curious as to whether or not that would be deliverable as a screen share. Um, but again, that's kind of at the level of me being curious rather than there being any evidence to back that up. Um, so I think it's just really important to think about how do we have that conversation with the patients about the pros and cons and are we doing it in a really explicit manner? And then obviously recording it on our contacts in a way that CQC can be really proud of us of doing. Um, so next slide, please. So thank you ever so much to all my lovely team in Suffolk and my counterparts in East Suffolk who's helped to feed into this. I just thought it would be useful to see what have been the, the snags and the benefits and experiences for us. Um, manipulating tests, if you are doing that in PPE, is really tricky. And certainly at one point we were being encouraged to do outdoor visits and doing outdoor visits during the time when it was a, a little mini heat wave over here, dressed in full plastic and just feeling like a lobster that was boiling in a pot was amazing. I loved that experience. Um, we've already talked a little bit about audibility with the face masks. So there are limits again on actually if we're doing face to face. Um, some of my colleagues have commented on, although we've got the, the formal and the full guidance on how to deliver the ACE remotely. On some occasions that hasn't shared in the correct way. Um, so there, there are some challenges still. Um, I think a, a general feeling that this requires a lot more preparation than you would normally expect to do if you're just going to see somebody in clinic face to face in a pre COVID way. Um, and so that preparation for putting the, the person at ease for putting yourself at ease so that you feel okay about doing it. Um, and so there's a suggestion of maybe a sort of a, a gradual building up. So starting with maybe a, a video just for the interview part, just to introduce the person to the, the video platform, then maybe progressing onto an ACE and then maybe progressing onto a full neuropsychology assessment. Um, but yeah, that sense of it's exhausting, this is hard work. Um, and also the, the, the experience of not being able to control the session and control in not necessarily a really controlling format, but just, you know, you may have set up the idea that this needs to be on a minimum of a 9.7 inch screen, but then actually maybe there's a difficulty at the patient's end and they problem solve and they decide to switch over to using a phone. You at your end won't necessarily know that. Um, you maybe can't prompt in the way that you could normally or maybe inhibit a prompt from a relative in the way that you would with subtle eye contact and sort of body language. So, um, and the concern that you can't necessarily motivate somebody in the same way or keep them on track. And so maybe people would give up a little bit more quickly than if you were there with them in the room. And a really big sense of actually how important it is to have a good team behind you, a really knowledgeable manager. Um, and so then, that's for the whole triage, for discussing, for testing remotely and practicing with each other. So important. Um, if I could pop onto the next slide, please. So we've got some feedback. Um, hopefully at the end, we might be able to see a video of one of the chaps that I've um, assessed and who consented to giving us some lovely video feedback. But um, so as you would expect, some people like the idea of, of taking this offer up. Some people prefer to wait for face to face. Um, I think we maybe have to be cautious and conscious of what we're, what we're doing if we're saying if somebody declines this format and declines to come in and then we discharge them from a waiting list, how do we sit with that ethically? Um, one of the uh, gentlemen though that was asked about his experiences, he said he definitely preferred the computer and for him he particularly liked it because it reduced his performance anxiety and that performance anxiety would have been present for him, whether he was seen in clinic or whether he was seen at home. It was just that being in a, a space with another human being was not nice for him. So he liked the computer. 
and it reduced the travel time so for this family it would have been a three hour round trip so that was really good for them um, some other feedback these and these are not about me it's not me blowing my own trumpet it's about a lovely team that I work with um, so the comment it felt like she was in the same room rather than online it really helped her to feel it easy. so it is possible to convey that sense of warmth and that compassion and clinical kindness that we can even if we were in the same room very good she's informative that really important to have that sense of knowing what you're talking about even if you don't <laughs> even if you've got no idea about the technology convey that is really good um, but the, also the patients are picking up on I wonder if it would have been easier for you to pick up on emotions and body language if, if we'd have been there in the same room um, and this patient said yeah but it wasn't ideal we couldn't see each other fully because we decided to use a phone you know so it's like oh dear but never mind and um and one particular person said, how would you go about delivering bad news online? So they were concerned for other recipients of these kinds of platforms, what that would be like. Um, can we skip on to the next slide, please? Yeah, so it, within the survey and just more widely, a number of concerns have, been come up, have come up about what does this mean legally? And I think it's an interesting question to sit with because you know what does this mean legally that can mean a number of things to different people so i'm always curious about what sits underneath that kind of question so we've talked a little bit about the copyright issues and i know pearson are dialing in to listen as well so they would even be available on the q a so i'm sure they could chip in with some answers um but apart from the copyright issues i think what can't sometimes sits underneath that is the fear of getting it wrong and obviously diagnostic neuropsychology lends itself very nicely to being right or being wrong and so hopefully we wouldn't have chosen to come into this particular profession if we can't sit with that possibility that at points it throughout the uh, duration of our career we're going to come to the wrong conclusion at some point um, and so I think one of the things is, is being curious about well how would I meet that fear so if I, if I worry about getting something wrong, in what way do I normally meet that fear? Um, and so hopefully what we'd do is we'd meet it with our own compassionate wisdom and we'd do the same kinds of things that we would do with any other clinical process. So we would maybe do extra reading around the, the subject. We might take it to a colleague and practice um, and take these things to supervision. But I guess what we probably wouldn't do if it was using our compassionate wisdom is to run for the hills screaming and avoid it completely. Um, because that's probably not likely to be in the patient's best interest. But I think the other part, so I'm just going to drink, drink. The other part of um, the question about the, the legal side is, do we have any legal guidelines to look to? has anything been written up to support us in, in coming up with these answers? Um, and so the Court of Protection um, is kind of, it's the most likely place where there's going to be an interface between patients with a memory problem and a legal issue. So if somebody, uh, if their dementia becomes so progressed that actually the, uh, the capacity questions get asked, then that would default to the Court of Protection. And the Court of Protection rallied around incredibly quickly at the beginning of this COVID pandemic um, and have drawn up lots of guidelines. So um, Anthony Hayden, so Mr. Honourable Mr. Justice Hayden, has, has said, you know, the, the litigants in the Court of Protection are right in the vanguard of this awful pandemic. So our patients are most likely to lose capacity, but also most likely to be vulnerable from the COVID difficulty. So the hyperlink there, which should get sent out it's a kind of a two-page guideline um, predominantly for assessors of court of protection capacity assessments but I think the important thing that I've lifted out there is where he's saying I think it's prudent to indicate that visits should only be made to P so the person where that is assessed to be absolutely necessary and the bold print is in in the original document alternative arrangements should be always be considered first such as telephone facetime and skype conferencing and if you have a particular interest in this kind of thing then the hyperlink at the bottom is to an hour um, webinar about the law and uh, using call to protection and visiting rights so i think 
in, in that sense, you know, if we're offering remote um, testing, we are following the guidance of what we're really being asked to do at a legal level as well. So I think there's, you know, there's some nice bits of reassuring information at different levels that, that can hopefully help us with that. Um, and I think that's me. So thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. That's really helpful. There's definitely some things in there that I have no idea about, so <laughs> much appreciated. Um, okay, so I'm just going to kind of run through these slides fairly quickly because I'm keen that we get the chance to look at the video, um, actually, which feels really, really helpful. Um, so just briefly on, the, on this note, um, it's a quote by Cullum et al. Um, in their 2020 presentation on risk management. And it's just a note that we're always assessing, but we don't always test. So as clinical psychologists and neuropsychologists, we have lots of skills to draw on with assessment, formulation and intervention that don't necessarily even relate to doing the act of administering formal neuropsychological measures. Um, so on the slide, there's an example of a referral where we might question the value of doing formal neuro at present, likely COVID or no COVID really. So this is a man with Parkinson's disease, requested neuropsychological assessment to establish whether he's experiencing dementia or MCI, but he has some comorbidities. So he's got chronic, uh, he, he's um, an alcoholic. He is also prescribed anticholinergic medication um, and he's uh, struggling with his sleep. And there's a couple of other examples there too with untreated sleep apnea and significant comorbid mental health problems. So we might question here, would test scores really add to any differential diagnosis without first addressing those comorbidities? Um, and really it's just a note that much can still be done and the person might be able to come back later on once the other factors have been addressed that might be affecting cognition. Next slide, please. Um, so just a very quick note on practicalities. I think Wendy's covered a, a lot of these um, issues really. Um, but it's just to note that the clinical interview, as we've said, can be done remotely regardless of testing. Um, and I think some questionnaires can be particularly helpful in just aiding that, the process of information gathering. Um, we will be interpreting cautiously and, and there might be a value of repeated or extended assessment where performance is compared over time. Preparation and practice is so pivotal. Um, so when I was using the document camera to administer the VOS, I couldn't quite work out like the orientation that I should be using. And so I had to practice on the assistant site just to check that they could see it in the way I thought they could see it. Um, so that was really valuable, just making sure that I took the time to kind of really familiarise myself with what, what I was doing. Um, and I'd highly recommend it. Um, and um, I guess it's just to note as well that because face-to-face um, -face and PPE assessment also isn't validated, I guess we're all in slightly uncharted territory. I think there was a question on the chat about using PPE while administering tests remotely in non-COVID secure environments. Um, and I guess that adds an additional layer of challenge because the person can't necessarily see your facial expressions in full. Um, and just to note as well, it's not a one size fits all approach. So as Wendy said earlier on, those more moderate or severe presentations that we might work with, it might be much more tricky to administer these sorts of measures at the moment. Um, and I'm not sure that there's necessarily an easy solution for that. But there's certainly a lot of other things that we can do that aren't testing related per se. Um, and just a note there, which I won't go through about acknowledging environmental limitations. Um, one of the things that I was really struck by was that inability to direct my eye gaze to people to, you know, ask them for help at a specific time or, you know, tell them not to, to, to say anything, um, which you normally would do if you're in clinic with the person um, and their carer briefly. Um, uh, you know, so, so it's just thinking about those additional challenges, really, um, and that there is a risk of distraction, despite the best efforts of all people concerned. Sometimes during one assessment that I did, somebody just sort of waltzed in during the middle of a verbal fluency task. And these things, they happen. I think it's just about making notes when they do so that you can incorporate that into your interpretation. Um, so, so, yeah. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is my disclaimer. I've collated these uh, tests and I've put them into different domains uh, of cognitive functions that they kind of measure or relate to. Not all of this is evidence-based. Um, in fact, a, 
a lot of it isn't, so please don't take it as kind of rich. Um, the ones with stars next to them are partially or kind of strongly supported by the evidence we have so far. Um, but the ones that do not have stars by them are just my kind of take on face validity. Um, so um, these are just the measures that I have considered doing or would consider doing myself uh, with the appropriate clauses put in. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, there's another list there where I've broken it down into auditory and visual working memory, language and perception. And if you could go to the next slide, um, we've got visual memory and verbal memory and some praxis, praxis based tasks as well. Um, and the next slide. Um, executive function um, and social cognition and some performance validity measures which I expect although I've not done any research on it might have additional challenges at the moment um, and the next slide please okay um, that list probably isn't exhaustive either it was just kind of what I had time to pull together um, so the possibilities locally, some of the concerns raised on the survey related to things like lack of clinical governance, training, um, access to kind of materials. And just to share a bit about what we've been doing in Worcestershire, we're kind of developing our own um, governance around these things um, with appropriate consent forms and, and processes and crib sheets. Um, and uh, also we're putting a proposal in for access to Q Global um, so that when the free access runs out we have a continuity in that provision um, and we've ordered some document cameras so that we can continue this remote administration uh, for things that aren't on Q global um, and uh, we're also doing a bit of an evaluation to demonstrate the, the, the worth of this approach to patients as well um, so it's just some suggestions that you may want to consider in terms of um, thinking about how to apply these things in a, in a governed way locally um, so I'll go to the next slide um, and this is the video and then we'll have some chance for questions as well. Um, Brian, thank you ever so much for agreeing to do this video for me. Um, as I explained to you, really, it's for us as, as clinicians to learn from you about what your experience was like so that anything that was good, maybe we can replicate anything that was difficult or you didn't like, maybe we could change in the way that we provide this service. Um, so when, when I first phoned you and suggested that we did these tests over the internet. What did you first think? Or what were your feelings about being offered that? I felt all right about that. Yes, I'd already been, as you know, into a doctor in Haverhill with a, a just a verbal discussion and that was then referred really through to you. So no, that was fine. I didn't have a problem with that. Okay, so the idea about having to do some tests on the internet, that sat quite comfortably with you, did it? It did, really, yes. Okay, and yeah. then, so I sent you through um, a, a link by email. And you did. Did that, seem, <laughs> yeah. did that seem to be okay or not? You kind of go, Ooh. <laughs> No, I mean, I can't remember now whether I'd actually done something similar before or whether that was the first time. I know I've now done a couple of them. Ours worked very well. Another one that I went on to just don't tell anybody else this because you know, no, sorry. Um, the person who'd set it up hadn't paid a particular sum of money. <laughs> so I, I, I tried to connect and I tried to connect and I tried to connect, and I tried to connect, and then she sent me a message saying, I'm sorry, but you can't connect because I haven't paid the money. So, anyway, <laughs> our, our connection was very quickly achieved, wasn't it? Yours and mine. Yes, yeah. yeah. So, so luckily, the, we have paid our connection fee. <laughs> so, we yeah. to meet, weren't we? But, um, but I think the very first time that we met, it was a bit tricky for you. So, I think you had your wife there with you didn't you to yeah. to connect and 
I think some of the things a bit like today when we first connected the video worked and the sound didn't and then so we were using the phone weren't we to work how to yeah I wasn't quite sure what was going to happen there because you said I will phone you so I, I was just waiting for this particular phone I suppose my landline and my mobile was downstairs so you rang the mobile and Jan said oh it's your mobile it's your mobile <laughs> and I did look at it quickly and I tried to go, as you do, don't you? You sort of go, to go out. Um, and it just, it just went off. So yeah. Anyway. Yeah. I knew you were calling. Good. So we, we somehow got it to work together, didn't we? We and, did. Um, so, you don't, so you don't remember there being any glitches when we first met to do the tests? Not that I recall. No, no. Okay, good, good. And then doing the actual test, what was that like? So I read out stories to you and got you to repeat them and showed you pick puzzles and things like that. What was that like doing that over the over the computer? Um, well, obviously I hadn't done such things for a long time. So it was a, yeah, tricky to start off with. Some of them I found relatively easy I suppose and then you'll know that anyway and and others I found a bit more difficult um, mm. I think sometimes perhaps diagrams more difficult than you know chatting or something like that but um, there were stories as well weren't there, that I had to get pieces of information out of yeah that's I coped, with, I coped with a fair bit of it but not with all of it as you know yeah so I think, like you say, the diagrams are maybe a bit more difficult to see or to, to make sense of on the computer than just being able to chat. Yes. And of course, you had to provide your own piece of paper at your end, didn't you? And so you did some drawings for me. And then when you'd finished them, you tooled them up for me in front of the screen so I could see that you went. Oh, did I? I don't even remember that. Sorry, I'm now, what is it? My wife tells me, I right? I thought I was 68. She says I'm 78. So, um, <laughs> you know, the memory's not as it was. Yeah, but. I had an extremely good memory for work, but for other things, maybe not so. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you, did, you did really very well. Um, I was going to ask you as well, during the testing, did anything pop up onto your laptop screen? So sometimes people notice things popping up in the corner of the screen, like an advert or something. Did that happen for you? No. No, I don't no. recall that. No. Okay. And if you were going to be offered to do these tests all over again, which I'm not mm. thinking that we do, but <laughs> if you were... And you were offered the choice next time of doing the tests again in your home over the internet or doing the tests in a clinic where I would see you and we would meet face to face. Which do you mm. think you would choose? Mm. I'm not entirely sure. I mean, that sounds bad really, doesn't it? As I said, I did one test with another doctor in Haverhill, um, yeah, and he did things. I found this okay, really, mm -hmm. this, this sort of technique. I found it all right. And it saves me a journey, or it saves you a journey, <laughs> whichever, or the person who's going to interview, sorry, whoever's going to interview, it saves, you know, I'd have yeah. to come across the ferry, wouldn't I, if, if we were to do it verbally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, so this, this this I'm reasonably comfortable with this. But we'll find out if I have to have to if I have to do another one. <laughs> well at the moment there's no plan to do another one, but that's really helpful. Thank you. Is there anything you wanted to comment about these tests over the internet that I haven't asked? Any any other comments that you've got? I can't think of any, no, no. Okay, we, lovely. We seem to have covered most of, yeah. yeah. Good. Well, thank you so much for your, for your feedback. That's uh -huh.
Rebecca, was there anything else you wanted to say about that before we move on? Yeah, just to add a, a big thank you to, um, to Brian for consenting to share that with everybody. Um, it was interesting, though, because my experience of uh, enabling him to access that was very different to what he's retained. So it took about 20 minutes of a lot of difficulty um, of helping them to access the internet, helping them to um, get onto it. And so I think when I reflected on it, I was thinking, gosh, you know, maybe there was something a bit paternalistic had come up in me wanting to to prevent him or you know any of the patients from experiencing frustration. But actually what's left with him is that it was a fine experience and, you know, he could tolerate that frustration. It's not stuck emotionally. Um, so it was, it was actually really nice to go back and get some uh, feedback. But yeah, thank you for listening to him. Thank you for sharing. It's, it's really valuable to see his experiences. Much appreciated. Um, OK, so we've got some just some useful links and information here, um, including the papers that have been referred to so far by Renee. Um, and if we go on to the next slide, um, I think we've got some time for questions. Um, can I just, before we do that, just say a huge thank you to um, Renee and Wendy for logging into Australia over in the afternoon in, in, in their time zone. And a huge thank you to Rebecca as well for, um, for facilitating and talking about the medical, legal and local issues. Um, and a thank you to the team um, supporting from MSAT too. So. We've got some, got about nine minutes for questions at a bit of a push, so. <laughs> We'd just like to say um, thank you so much, Rebecca and Julia, and to Sinead and Sarah also for helping organising this um, and for um, inviting us to speak. It's been a delight and a pleasure for us, and it's been lovely to get to know our UK colleagues and work out um, how others are uh, surviving um, through this very difficult pandemic, particularly for us in Melbourne at the moment, we're getting now quite high numbers of COVID and it's been great to actually be able to learn from you about the models that you've worked through, which is how to so, um, service clients um, the best you can during this really difficult time. So thank you. Sarah, is there anything from the Q&A that you think needs um, addressing? I'm not sure if people could hear me. So there, there's a few questions that haven't been answered. Uh, some of them, there's still some comments about um, Pearson. I think most of them have been answered. I'll just go through the questions and I'll come back to that. So uh, one question is about home-based assessments having longer waits and a question about how that gets balanced rating this against clinical needs. So basically, is there this question about do people with greater clinical need and can't engage remotely potentially end up waiting longer? So I suppose just wondering how people are balancing those demands. Um, I don't know if anyone's got any comments on that. And there's a few more comments also on how people are using test materials. With yeah, so in, in our clinic... Sorry, sure, go. Yeah, I'm happy to speak. Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm speaking or not speaking, I'm just interrupting generally as I normally do. Um, so in terms of the, who's having to wait and how do they wait? So for me, if, if somebody needs a neuropsychology assessment, they would end up on the neuropsychology waiting list. I would then have a set amount of clinic, clinical time to that. Um, and then I would prioritise based on clinical need. And then I would see the person wherever they need to be seen. So if that person needs to be seen remotely, if they need to be seen face to face in their own home or in the clinic, that kind of doesn't matter. So, so I, I meet their need wherever that happens to be. Um, I don't know if that's the same everywhere. Uh, and we actually worked out with the need for sort of empty space for turning around um, patients. So, so you have a, a, a po I'm not making this clear at all, am I? A patient comes to clinic. They have their clinical slot, but then you need a little bit of dead time in order to deep clean before the next patient. We've worked out that actually once you factored in travelling time to do a home visit, you've pretty much seen the same number of people in the same time. So. Thank you so much. There, there's a couple of questions around have people had experience of doing assessments in PPE with face masks? Have people actually managed some of the practicalities about sort of... Uh, managing things in people's homes or sharing information. I have to say I'm attempting this for the first time tomorrow so I'm also interested. Uh, 
any any comments on that? I haven't yet done one. Um, in uh, so go, Julia. No, no, you carry on, Wendy. Oh, no, look, I think you guys have had a lot more experience with PPE than we have, but um, just from even having to be on the ward, it's incredibly hot. That's probably our first um, impression of it. And also quite difficult. Um, I think a lot of the clients get extremely worried when you come in all garbed up. You know, it's, um, it's anxiety provoking for people and also for you going onto a ward or um, in a situation where you're not sure about the risk. Well, go ahead, Julia. I have literally no experience to feed back on, but I know that the access to masks where you can show your facial expression um, tend to help. But I know that in the UK, this is quite limited in terms of the resources, my understanding. Um, so that's all I had to add. Okay, so I guess we're all going to have to sort of try and find out about that. Like I said, I literally have to pick up my PPE kit, which is apparently in the office somewhere today to go and do a visit tomorrow. So that would be very interesting to see. And I am a trainee is coming with me. So hopefully between us, we can manage some of the practical bits about handing things out and taking notes and making the person hopefully feel at ease to engage in it. So I've spoken to him on the phone, so I think he will be all right with it and won't be too spooked by us turning up, but time will tell. Uh, there's a very practical question about how do you produce, reduce bandwidth? Band, sorry, I'm losing the ability to speak. Bandwidth. Um, I'm assuming that's to do with turning off uh, things that you don't need, but I only know that from Teams meetings. Somebody might know the actual answer. Look, I can only speak to it. Obviously, um, we use a platform called CoView, and in the settings, you can actually reduce the bandwidth to what's called bandwidth, which means it's a little bit grainier, but it's much more stable. I don't know if you can do it on WebEx. Um, we do have WebEx here, but I haven't tried it because we use CoView for telehealth consults, but that'd be worth trying. Uh, and certainly the more people you have on the call, um, the more bandwidth it takes. So trying to reduce everything else to possible and close down everything else is useful. I don't know, Rebecca, if you can on, on WebEx reduce the bandwidth. Uh, I think it's Julia that uses WebEx, not me. And I am absolutely not the right person to answer questions about technical matters. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll find out for you about WebEx and get back to you. And then maybe you can email the people that have registered. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, it's just all of this making me think that the comment about that one of the best tips is to be unflappable is very, <laughs> one of the things we really need to sort of work on because I think there's a lot to manage in it. I just wonder, there's been a lot of comments which have been partially answered about um, Pearson's and copyright and can you scan, can't you scan? Is, there, is it kind of okay to do whatever you need to do for the moment? I think the comment that in Australia that ends at the end of the month. Um, I don't know if anyone's able to answer. My hope would be, I know we're probably going to have to go towards buying Q Global stuff. I'm, I'm thinking about the cost of setting things up, sorting out with the trust to get cameras, Q Global, possibly tablets, all of that's going to take a bit of time. So I'm, I'm hoping there might be some flexibility about being able to do things as best one can without flaunting copyright issues. I don't know if anyone's able to comment on that. I don't know what's possible for now? Um, certainly in Australia, Sarah, um, the letter of no objection is continuing. So um, you can still use a document camera. Um, if you don't have access to Q Global, um, you can still use a document camera to share the stimuli. That's my impression after talking to our Pearson representative in Australia. Is that your impression, Renee, as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I, it would be good to, I don't know if there's a, a UK representative here that could add, add anything to it in the Q&A or in the chat. But um, I, look, I'm not sure if it's different across different countries. Um, but yeah, certainly that's what's going on here. At the end of the month, um, those Q Global electronic stimulus books will be available for purchase. <clears throat> and they reassure us that they'll be at a similar price to what you'd pay for a hard copy one. So um, that's the situation here. But I'm hesitant to say that that will be the same in the UK. We've just had a comment from, from Anna Cypher who's saying that from talking to Pearson recently, scanning's not okay, cameras are okay. Um, if I've read that quickly, the comments just vanished a bit. So, and that seems to be what people are saying. It's are illegal to scan, it's illegal to um, scan anything and put it on a PowerPoint yourself, but um, you can still use a document camera or have to use Q Global. Yeah. I hope we can order document cameras nice and quickly and <laughs> trust the brief days happening. So, okay, thank you. 
Are, are there Wait, any just a, just a quick questions? tip, sorry, about that. Um, a lot of people are actually using webcams fixed onto things, and they work just as well as a document camera, to be honest okay. with you. So some people are really struggling to find document cameras, and actually webcams are fine. Work as well. Fine, thank you. That's, that's helpful to me. So I think that's the concern, isn't it, for us, and I'm sure others in similar situation. We had been close to referral. We're just opening up. There's going to be a pressure to do things quickly, and I'm very mindful of speakers at the start saying, we shouldn't feel under pressure. We've got to kind of take time to get this right. And I think there's, there's that balance, isn't there? So um, hopefully we can get the support to, to buy and get the equipment as we need it and, and take the time to kind of balance so we get things right and practice so we get things right. Um, otherwise, we're just going to kind of it's sort of a false economy really to get going before we're comfortable with what we're doing. But I'm sure all the talks we've had today should be a huge help to, to all of us. Um, there's some more questions coming in. I don't know how we are on timing. Microsoft Teams has a question about the guidance on that. Um, are there any recommendations and guidelines? I don't know if anybody knows the answer to that. We use them. Um, we find it hard because people find it hard to access it, but we're, we're trying to work with that at the moment. Does anybody else know the answer to that? Is there a, a trial run model to make sure things are up and running? No, here in Australia, it's WebEx, um, some Zoom for non-clinical things and um, CoView, but we don't have experience in Microsoft Teams for telehealth consults, unfortunately. Well, I don't, I don't think. Renee? No, no. We got guidance from our own Australian Psychological Society on which kind of platforms were um, more recommended than others, and CoView very much came up at, at the top, so that's where we're going, but... Um, Obviously, again, every country is different. <clears throat> That's great. Thank you. The, the trial run thing, I know that when we have used it, we've got somebody to kind of try and check that somebody can actually log on with it before we have the formal appointment. Um, and sometimes that's helped, but not always. So thank you for that. Uh, I'm, I'm mindful of time. Do we have more time or should we be closing up? If I can have some advice from MSNAP colleagues. Uh, I know there are some questions I'm trying to sort of skim through quickly that might not be quite answered yet. Uh, I'm happy for you to answer more to questions. Questions. We have to go comments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, up to, up to you, so happy to do more questions. We can always, um, people can leave and we can share the recording. Okay, sure. So there was another question which I, I, I might have missed the focus of where this came from. Somebody saying they're slightly concerned about what people are deeming as absolutely necessary uh, in terms of assessment. Uh, is that kind of about when you see people in person? I guess that might well be. Does anybody have any, any thoughts on, on that? I, I, I'm familiar with that sort of term. Yeah, we've had um, in Australia a little bit of um, guidance regarding that, but I suppose we've used the analogy of um, emergency surgery versus elective surgery, that um, here a lot of elective surgery has been closed down, but emergency surgery has continued. And I think that's a nice analogy. And if you have to see people face to face, um, Obviously, it's the ones that are more urgent or more acute or there's more risk or more worry, as we talked about before. Um, but I am very mindful, though, that the um, number of people that are the most vulnerable don't have access to technology. And I think Rebecca and Julia talked a little bit about that before, just making sure that they get an equitable service so they're not just even more disadvantaged than before. Maybe Rebecca and Julia would like to add more. Yes, it's a good question because obviously that absolutely necessary comments came from uh, uh, the Justice Hayden. Um, and so I wonder if it's also something to kind of think about within our own supervision practices of what we consider to be absolutely necessary clinically. Um, in our trust, there's also been a newly established ethics team to kind of weigh up, bash out some of these new questions that are arising because of COVID. So it might be worth seeking advice from your um, ethics team and also maybe from your legal team, you know, this has come from a legal document, so is it worth seeking some advice there? But, um, but I think ultimately we are clinicians, so it has to be, is it clinically, is it going to make a difference to this person's experience um, and to their trajectory and their prognosis if they get this, this service right now? Yeah, I don't really have anything to add on top of that. Um, I, I think it is something for team discussions and, um, as you mentioned, Rebecca, supervision discussions as well about the need um, 
and weighing that up just so that that decision is, is kind of shared and, and thought about. Um, but I, I think it's a difficult one. I know that where there's been issues around risk in relation to driving and the person hasn't been able to access remote um, uh, remote assessment, we've been considering it a bit more, but I think it's early days. Um, so, I think we always look about whether it will change the clinical management of the person. So if you're coming into a memory clinic to look to get an assessment of dementia and uh, you get a diagnosis of dementia, well, is that going to change the clinical management for the person? And for some people, for example, if they're 95 and other chronic, you know, lots of medical issues, um, Alzheimer's on top of that may not actually make that much of a difference. But for someone that's 55 that's still working, that may be managing a company that's needing an assessment to make sure they're not making mistakes or um, get their superannuation or other things um, or save their marriage if they've got BBFTD and there's personality change, then that probably is a little bit more pressing and therefore it's a bit higher on the priority list from our point of view. Can I just mention something about PPE that I, I don't think we addressed earlier on? Um, I think people are asking about kind of the logistics of safety and infection control around stimulus books, uh, record sheets and taking them back to the office. Um, in Worcestershire, we're pulling together PPE kind of packs. So we've got a laminated um, kind of uh, screen that you kind of place over the stimuli so that if the person touches it it doesn't get um, potentially contaminated and we leave them for a certain amount of time um, as well as having envelopes for kind of clean materials and potentially dirty materials um, so we pulled together a little pack like that I haven't fully got my head around it yet but I just wanted um, people to know that that that's a possibility to help with that sort of safety um, and there's been a presentation that was released by colleagues, I think, in Tyne and Ware, where they'd um, pulled together some recommendations around that. So I could see if it's OK to share that if people would like it. Um, I'll find out. Other people might have more experience with that. But I know it's a concern at the moment around transferring items between yourself and other people. Does anybody else want to add to that at all? No. OK. No, but that is helpful. Thank you. I was aware I had my eyes tested in spec savers and actually they had some really good ideas, which I tried about covering things in Clingfield and all sorts. But it sounds like you're ahead of the game on that. And I think, yes, using screens, keeping behind the screen as much as you can, just popping around the sides if you really need to. I think there's, there's lots of things to learn as well from other areas. So that's that's really helpful indeed. Um, I'm really mindful of time. I think we've, we've gone over, we've still got a lot of people here. They haven't all gone yet, but we're getting less questions and more comments. So um, has anybody got anything else they want to add before we wrap up? I think this, we've covered so much ground and I'm thinking some of the questions which are of course still slightly unanswered. We've got facilities, we've got like the MSNAP chat pages which come up. I know a lot of people on this call will probably be members of FPOP and again there's forums within FPOP for people to raise follow-up questions and, and discussions afterwards so through different means if there's ways you can follow on. I'm also struck by how much things have moved on since the first MSNAP SNAP webinar uh, probably just a couple of months ago in terms of the number of people who are now trying things moving on the questions have really changed in terms of what's coming up and lots more people are making headway into finding ways forward with things so but there's been so many useful tips and comments do, do any of the speakers want to add anything else before we go yeah i think look at some thanks sarah it's a great opportunity for um change i suppose and if you think about it when we did the webinar we did an australian webinar i'm um, back in early april and back then, um, people were very, very fearful about using teleneuropsychology. And now there's been absolutely enormous uptake across all of Australia in public hospital systems uh, because that's um, a useful way. Uh, and everyone was nervous and scared, but they used an opportunity to learn and upskill and get creative. And uh, as you say, you know, using webcams in different ways as document cameras and um, doing things that they wouldn't have thought of doing before. And I think sometimes, even though people are worried, sometimes just ripping off the Band-Aid and getting in there and having a go can be actually the best thing. And it's usually the clinicians that are terrified and worried about telehealth rather than the clients. And I think that's something to be useful to keep in mind. Yeah, to stay on. Yeah, I think <clears throat> that would be my last point too. I think there's legacy in all of this. You know, um, you know, I think a real problem here, and I think around the world is the lack of feedback that a lot of patients 
they don't get feedback because they do the assessment and then feedback would require a whole other, you know, trip into the clinic or whatever. Um, you know, things like telehealth might be a way of, you know, opening up ways to provide, you know, provide that feedback or that second session or if, if someone has got mobility issues, um, there's a whole bunch of reasons why telehealth might work longer term. Um, so it, beyond COVID, I can, I can see this as a bit of an agent of change. Um, Bit more intervention work there's, there's a real opportunity for improvement so, um, yeah the upskilling won't just be a, a short-term thing thank you so much Any, anybody else otherwise can i just say a huge thank you to to everyone involved um julia and rebecca have done so much work putting this together and renee and wendy joining us getting really unique perspectives about what's going on where you've been far more used to working in this way than we have. So I think the balance has been fantastic and lots of the comments have reflected that in terms of the balance of research, practical advice, just so much useful information to help people along the way. So thank you very much. It won't be the end of the conversation. I know the conversation will continue in different ways, but for today, um, if we can end there, thank you all for joining and thank you everyone for the questions as well, which have been, again, very thoughtful and, and led to more conversation. So goodbye for now and hope to see you all again sometime.